Commodities crash. Oil threatens to slip into the 20s. Gold sinks as investors sell everything. And energy equities are crushed. From big oil to premium players to leverage producers. We take you through the news, give you the analysis and the investment opportunities. I'm Alex Steele, and this is Bloomberg Commodities Edge. First, we kick it off with Spot On. It's our take on the big story, and today it's oil right around $30 a barrel. I spoke to Scott Sheffield, Pioneer Resources CEO, one of the Permian Pure Plays, about what that means for U.S. shale companies. I think most companies uh, will probably go into what I call maintenance mode. They'll probably get to flat production. Very few producers are hedged going into 21, so I would expect if we see low oil prices next year that most companies will not make it. We could easily lose uh, two, two and a half million barrels a day by the end of uh, 2021. Joining me now is Ed Morris, Global Head of Commodity Research at Citigroup. Ed, thanks for being here. Always a pleasure to be with you. Does it get that bad? Well, it could get that bad. I, you know, I agree with Scott that the producers are going into maintenance mode. Uh, it, they're really still a function of what the price of oil is going to be. We reckon that uh, if WTI stayed at $40 a barrel, production would eventually flatten itself out. Now, plus or minus a little bit on the shell side. If it goes down to 35 or 30, then the numbers that Scott put on the table are exactly right. You get to a million and a half to two million barrels a day of cut, similar to what happened post 20, you know, 16, really. So, how do we get a bottom here uh, in oil as we sit like right at 30? So, you know, we, we've been thinking about this. In 2016, we did a piece called Oil Mageddon, and, and we thought through, you know, how does the market rebalance? Eventually, all markets rebalance. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a function of supply and demand, and there'll be a little give. You know, as Scott indicated, the U.S. as the, as the swing supplier, in, uh, in fact, uh, has to go down to where the, 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 the call on shale has to, happens to be. And you could, you could, you could put in scenarios and the call on shale is where it is now. It could be a little higher, a little lower. Uh, the function of the market, the functioning of the market is a little bit more complicated than this, you know, this thing that's going on with the coronavirus really giving us a demand shock and, mm -hmm. uh, and the two of the three major producers going into a, a market share price war. Uh, we've had it before. They come to an end. Uh, they come to an end actually by logic. There's a point at which nobody wants to buy the oil. They don't want to buy it because the cost of storage is too high. They don't want to buy it because they don't need it. They don't want to, you know, you, we're going to have refineries that are going to be reducing demand for oil. And sometime between now and the end of the year, this comes to an end. We think sooner rather than later. So what we are seeing is all super contango. So yeah. the months today versus, say, 12 months, six yeah. months out are so much cheaper, drastically cheaper than uh, farther out. And that means that you're going to store oil now and sell it later. Uh, the rhetoric seems to be that we have a lot more storage opportunities today. So we're not going to run out, which potentially means we could still have this price war go on for a lot longer. Well, we could go on for a lot longer. But, you know, look at the numbers. We reckon that in, uh, in the first quarter, uh, the overhang of inventories was uh, over, you know, something like 2.6 million barrels a day, maybe mm -hmm. 2.8 million barrels a day. 90 days worth of that is 240, 250 million barrels. Well, we think the second quarter is going to be deeper. Could be, uh, could be a relatively lowish number, only only 300 some barrels a day. But that over 90 days is another 200 and some. So we we can get in our modeling. We think there is enough storage to handle things. We only see an increase of like 430. Five million barrels for the year as a whole, uh, if everything goes the way we think it is. But we could be in a situation where the overhang is something we've never seen before. It could be two billion barrels. And the world does not have enough inventory capacity for that. I think there's one interesting thing that could happen on inventories. We saw it happen in 2009. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the China Saudi relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 2000 and, uh, in 2009, uh, the oil prices went down. The Saudis sold around 500,000 barrels a day for more than four months mm -hmm. to China to let it fill up its strategic stockpile. So we think between the commercial and strategic stockpile capacity in China, we could have China buying actually 750,000 barrels a day for wow. three quarters of a year before they, you know, run out of storage capacity. So 
there, there is some space there for some kind of deal on the horizon. And do they just hold it or do they make it into product and then flood the product market, which is already getting hit by the virus and then now with this travel ban from Europe to the U.S. has really pummeled uh, jet fuel prices as well. So how does that play out? Well, it plays out in a, in a kind of ugly way. So you talked about the contango and mm -hmm. the contango being an indication that it, it's usually an indication that storage is tight mm -hmm. and you need more expensive storage so the prompt has to fall lower. But here we have the prompt falling lower because suppliers in the market, particularly the Saudis, have said, hey, we've got inventory and we've got production capacity and we're going to drop the price to a discount to wherever the buyer it's going to be so attractive that the buyer is going to line up to get yeah. get the oil. So that's what's really happened. And they did line up because when we started only last Saturday, mm -hmm. before last Saturday, we had, you know, Brent in backwardation, not Contango. Uh, we had in the kind of oil that Saudi Arabia sells a very high demand because mm -hmm. OPEC Plus had taken all of the, you know, the sour crude out of the market. And all of a sudden you get sour crude. And the refiners, whether they're in the U.S. Gulf Coast or in China, some parts of Northwest Europe, they can make more money more efficiently by refining this kind of crude. Mm -hmm. So the demand for it really went up, uh, but the price, had, you know, exacerbated the contango that the, that the world market fell in. Which is sort of music to Saudi's ears in some ways because they get the market share and they get the volume even if they don't have the price. Yeah. Which leads me to the war that Russia and Saudi Arabia are waging yeah. in the oil but market. Go back to where you just were. Yeah. You said what happens to the refiners. So they gobble it up because it's cheap and then we expect demand to really fall. So in our worst ca case scenario in which we have like what, what happened in China happening in the U.S., mm -hmm. not out of the question, mm -hmm. you know, not that remote but not a highly likely condition. China had a drop in uh, demand of about 4 million barrels a day in the month of February. It was pretty steep. If we have a China-like phenomenon uh, in the world outside of China, including the U.S., that would be a drop of 12 million barrels a day of demand. So, yeah, we have the supply overhang, but we have the demand problem. And then what is the refiner going to do? There's not going to be anyone to sell it to. Right. And the crack spreads are going to go down, and they're going to stop wanting to buy that crude oil. So that, that answered that other question. So what does that market look like? Um, that market looks pretty ugly for refiners in mm -hmm. the months of April and May. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question is really, what does this mean for Saudi Arabia and Russia, mm -hmm. and how do they blink? Who blinks first? And that's, uh, I think that's the big open question at the moment. So answer the question. So who blinks first, how, why? Yeah, I, and it, it may be a dance. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, let me walk you through the dance. I mean, the, the Russians and the Saudis have a lot of cash to work their way through this. We know that the Russians have started using their cash. We know that uh, the central bank starts buying to support the ruble, because the ruble goes down when the price of oil goes down. So $42 Brent is a signal to buy oil to start using their mm -hmm. reserves. We don't know mm -hmm. how much they will be using, but we know this is something that the Russians are gonna have to start monitoring, even if they start with uh, more than a half a trillion dollars worth of reserves. The other thing they have to look at is who they're selling to. So mm -hmm. I don't think they expected the Saudi response to be quite as aggressive as it turned out to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they didn't expect this 12.2 or 3 million barrels a day to be supplied out of inventory and production. Yeah. And the way the Saudis did it, they took it out of inventory, not just at home, but abroad, including Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be the case that uh, the Russians had a locked-in market, uh, but most Russian oil is sold on a spot basis, not mm -hmm. on a long-term contract basis. The long-term contracts tend to be financial deals done in China, but the European market, the heart of Russian exports are mostly spot sales. And the Saudis really could have hurt them in that market. So it'll be interesting to see mm -hmm. when we look back at the end of April how much of a market share loss there has been to the Russian producers. Lots of intricacies with that war. Uh, Ed Morse of City, I really appreciate your perspective. It's been a very interesting week uh, for the oil market. And speaking of, it is a crude goodbye for two oil ETFs. And this week's crash in oil prices killed off the Wisdom Tree crude oil t three time daily ETFs that tracks WTI and Brent versions of the commodity. Now, they held a combined $10.3 million in assets and rely on swaps to deliver three times. The daily move in crude prices both lost 85% of their value. This is Bloomberg.
I'm Alex Steele. This is Bloomberg Commodities Edge. Time now for the data dig where we delve deep into the market trends of the week. So first up, you have oil inventory numbers rising 7.66 million barrels, the highest since November. Pad 3 in particular saw stocks rising to a June 2019 high. That actually could get worse as the export arb closes and Brent falls a lot faster than WTI. Lots of pessimism out there. Let's take a moment and look at some of the good news. Uh, one winner from the oil price crash is actually natural gas. If you have Permian players shutting in production, the associated gas that they produce could also be shut in. That means less U.S. production and higher prices. And one other winner here, uh, tanker rates. Saudi Arabia is preparing to unleash so much oil on the world that its own fleet can't actually handle it. So it's booked at least eight super tankers to load just this month, and tanker prices are flying. All right, now let's get into the ring. It's oil prices versus big oil. So shares of BP now at a 24-year low, uh, falling uh, d below the lows that we saw back in the oil spill of 2011. Investors worry about dividend cuts, capex, as well as debt. Uh, joining me now is Christian Malik, a head of EMEA oil and gas research uh, at J.P. Morgan. When the big oil guys get taken out like this, is this a screaming buy or what? I think this is a moment, Alex, where this is basically a consolidated capitulate in the sector. The companies which have uh, low gearing, their ability to be able to deliver low cash break evens is basically they manage um, their dividend, their capex at lower oil prices. Those are the ones that are going to be most resilient. And they're also the ones that aren't going to abandon ship. The companies that are able to still deliver volume into the medium term, because that's important. As we see the next cycle emerge, you want to be still holding. Uh, holding barrels as opposed to having abandoned or to be able to um, shut down and, and, and sort of defend yourself. So it really has to be resilience on one hand versus super cycle leverage to, in, in, in the sort of mid to longer term perspective. The problem though is that as all this is shaken out, the dividend yields of all these guys have just skyrocketed Absolutely. up. So they have the debt they still need to produce, they still need to spend on CapEx to keep production afloat, and then they have these enormous dividends that they have to pay. At what point, right. which companies are at risk for having to go back to the debt market or having some real problems? Yeah, I think the first, it's, it's, it's a great point. I think the first way to look at it is, so what are the cash break evens? I mean, post dividend, post capex, what all price do you need? And that for the sector at the moment is around $50. For BP, it's actually low. They had a more bearish view on oil, so they're positioned a bit more defensively at $45. So if your starting point is $45, and then you cut capex to sustainable levels, and then you basically re reduce your OPEX, you're down a sort of closer to $35 to $40, mm. which is not too far away from the oil price. Now, in the context of a lower oil price and say that the Saudis continue to squeeze and, 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 and dump oil into the market, I would expect then BP to, to sort of revert to more, more deep pockets in terms of lowering CapEx further to not just sustain, but even lower than that. But when you think about the question around who's going to blink first from the major's perspective, it's going to who's, who's, going, to, who's going to be able to manage the duration. So if we roll this into next year and all of a sudden we're now in a year's time, oil price hasn't changed, that's the point where I see them regrouping around the capital frameworks and taking a serious look at the dividend and whether it is just too pro-cyclical. I think at that point, the companies most at risk are Repsol, OMV, ENI, companies who have a high cash break even, who don't have much optionality and don't have much uh, uh, of a strong balance sheet to lean on. Does this set us up at any point for a supply gap later on if we go at least low prices uh, for a long period of time and they have to retrench uh, CapEx even further? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that because there's sort of a reap what you say moment in this sector, which is as the majors capitulate on CapEx and not just shale oil companies, but, the, but all the majors across the world, which is in fact, I think, what the Saudis are trying to do. They're trying to inflict maximum pain within this duration where you see an irreversible dent on CapEx on capital frames. If that's the starting point going into the next cycle, what you will then see is supply, which we already forecast peaking within two years, just being pushed forward. So there's a sort of a positive corollary from this, 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 this very dark hour in that, in that ultimately over the medium term you see a lot more production coming off very quickly. And I think to some extent that's what the majors are counting on as they think about a through cycle uh, capital frame and their dividend, which is, well, if we're all cutting capex, that means that everyone's cutting capex and that means that production from non-OPEC, non-US is going to roll over a lot sooner and therefore the cost curve comes to bite. But that all depends on the Saudi stance. Mm -hmm. Does the, do the Saudis continue to roll this out over the next few years? Um, or do they basically inflict maximum pain, see the capitulation, and then come back to the table? We think so. 
Uh, Kristen, really great perspective. Thank you so much, Kristen Malik of JP Morgan. Thank, Thank you. you. And time now for our note of the week. It comes from Wood McKenzie, who warns on the longer term consequences of lower gas prices. They say restricted capital investment budgets, reduced appetite for financing LNG projects with exposure to oil prices. You got US LNG projects selling on a Henry Hub Plus basis will also be perceived as less competitive than oil index LNG. And as a result, there's going to be fewer LNG projects taking FID in 2020 and 2021. Brutal for the export guys. This is Bloomberg. Alex Steele. This is Bloomberg Commodities Edge. A time now for the BNF Brief gives you in-depth analysis on clean energy, advanced transport, commodities, and emerging technologies. President Trump suspending travel from Europe, excluding the UK, and all of this battering the already beaten up jet fuel market. Joining me now from London is David Doherty of Bloomberg NEF. Uh, David, you guys ran the calculations. How much jet fuel is going to be really impacted by this? Hi, Alex. Yeah. At a time when it's pretty bad already for the aviation market, we think there's about 450 flights daily that will be disrupted by this. That's about uh, 180,000 barrels per day of Jeff demand. David, how much jet fuel will be impacted? Sure. So the impact of the ban on European to New York flights essentially will be about 180,000 barrels per day. It's about 450 flights every day. What have we learned in terms of what China has done and what kind of recovery they're in versus what we may then be able to expect from, say, European and U.S. demand? Sure. Well, in China, we've seen a very slow recovery, and it's come in the form of domestic flights by domestic aircraft and aviation. So while China is about six or seven weeks ahead of us in the curve of the coronavirus impact, Europe and the U.S. are really at the start of it. So we could see prolonged disruption for at least six or seven weeks still. And we haven't seen a bounce back like we have seen in, um, in previous events like SARS. It's been a very slow recovery and a plateau at the bottom, essentially, in China. So from the demand sense, then, in Europe, it's going to be really rough. But later on, isn't this better because they have lower fuel prices and that's going to wind up being good for them longer term to help their uh, margins, for example? In terms of aviation market, it could be if they haven't already locked in their price through hedges, essentially. Mm. And that is the real risk. If you've got low jet, uh, you know, jet prices, that's great if you have air mile demand. The problem at the moment is there's no air mile demand. So essentially, you can operate ghost flights to maintain your operating slot. Or if that's been removed, like it has been in the EU, you do not operate that flight. But you still have that jet hedge in place, so you need to unwind it. So it's quite risky for the aviation market as it stands. Wow, David, great analysis. Thank you very much, David Doherty of Bloomberg NEF. Let's turn to Commodity in Chief, where we focus on one executive in the commodity world. And today is Harry Breckelmans of Shell. First, a closer look at his company. Shell has a problem. It wants to become the biggest power company in the world in 15 years. It is still an integrated oil giant hurt by its weaker chemical and downstream businesses. It wants its power sector division to deliver 8 to 12 percent returns. It is slowing its pace of buybacks because it can't make enough money to cover capex and shareholder payouts. Shell sold the idea of becoming a more climate-friendly company to shareholders, but it required rising oil and gas prices to do it. Then the market turned. Investors want big oil to go green, but they don't want to suffer lower payouts to do it. One possible solution is AI. It can do things like cut upstream costs, shave off downtime, increase output. Maybe you can cut costs enough to improve your cash flow. One example, Shell saved $2 million by avoiding refinery outage using predictive analytics. Basically, catch an outage before it happens. Bloomberg NEF estimates refineries can cut maintenance costs by over 20% when using this kind of technology. This can be key to a producer stuck in the middle of the energy transition. I recently caught up with Harry Brecklemans of Shell and asked him about the environment for oil. Today we're in a quite challenging environment. I would say that puts all the more the owners on us to be very responsible and efficient in, uh, in what we do and how we go about our business. When you take a look at the technology that's going to be coming up then, what are you most excited about? Is there one that you're most jazzed, you think is going to have the biggest impact? Uh, I wouldn't point at one single technology, I would say digital. Uh, we talked about AI mm -hmm. and its applications before. 
I think it's so pervasive, so it will play a significant role in all aspects of our business, mm -hmm. without necessarily pointing at one in particular. Um, I would point at the role of hydrogen, for example, uh, and I, I think the world's just coming alive to the potential that hydrogen has in all aspects, in helping to decarbonize the energy mix mm -hmm. uh, and provide a multitude of solutions from you know, applications in transport to applications in storage. So if you walk me out five to ten years, what's, what are you going to be spending all the money on? What are the uh, projects that are going to be developed? Well, we'll still be spending money on traditional, so to speak, oil and gas uh, projects, of course, uh, because that is still needed in the overall energy mix. But I would imagine we'd be uh, spending uh, significant amounts of money on electrification through renewables. Uh, we would spending, we'd be spending significant amounts of money on developing ways to uh, turn hydrogen into fuels and, uh, and energy products for people. Uh, we certainly be very present in biofuels. We'll be investing in carbon capture mm -hmm. uh, and storage or the use of CO2. Uh, and we've been spending money on uh, nature-based solutions, as we call them. So ways to use nature to uh, sequester and absorb carbon. Shareholders want that. But then the stock underperforms like a Chevron or Total, right? Like the quarter was confusing for shareholders because mm. they want it, but then they're upset about the slowing pace of buybacks. How does that inform the conversation at Shell? Well, I think in one way it, it tells us that uh, we need to do even more. Uh, we need to do it faster. So not pull back, go full speed ahead? Yeah, no, I certainly feel that, that generally, and I think this is the consensus globally, isn't it, that we're not moving fast enough collectively. So, so it really suggests that we need to up our efforts in terms of catalyzing, actually, the world to, to go faster. But Shell's started. definitely been front and center in all of that, and yeah. you haven't gotten rewarded for it. So yeah, why do yeah. it? Well, I think you also have to look at this in, in, as you said it, it's a complex world. You need to look at it through lenses of the, the near, the medium and the long term. And I think, indeed, indeed in the markets struggle to sort of read between the, the short, the medium and the long term in terms of the current environment, mm -hmm. whatever the future will bring and how companies are navigating through that. It's on us to create more clarity around that. Uh, and then, of course, to follow that with demonstration. Uh, so I think we're encouraged to more demonstration also helping to clarify, I think most importantly perhaps, to bring others you know, together with us mm -hmm. in terms of finding those solutions. So then the rhetoric after the quarter, I think one analyst said like Shell wanted to do it all and they failed. Yeah. Well, you know, they have high expectations. And uh, so, uh, you know, we, we live to fight another day, we have the next quarter to go and, and then much beyond that. So I think we generally feel that we are on the right course. Uh, but, of course, you know, you have to demonstrate it out there every day. That does it for Bloomberg Commodities Edge. Make sure to catch us each Thursday at 1 p.m. New York time, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.